you uh, you buckle up when you get into the car. You put on your seat belt. Why do you do it? How do you do it? Do you get into the car every time you go for a drive and remind yourself of the possibility of getting into a car accident? Do you visualize the horrible results? Do you ever watch a video in slow motion of a person in an accident? Not a dummy, a human being. Do you do that every time you fasten your seatbelt? I mean, after all, isn't that what you're doing? You're putting on the seatbelt to prevent yourself from uh, going through the windshield, from hitting the dashboard. You get the idea. I hope you don't. Maybe the first time when you needed to be convinced that wearing a seatbelt is important, uh, people described in graphic detail the horrors of being in an accident without it. But were they ever meant to intimidate you? To make you paranoid? To have you think and visualize the horrors of an accident, what's going to happen to your head, to your face? No. no. If you're putting on your seat belt, you're doing what you need to do. Now enjoy the ride. Think about the amazing creation that a car is. It really is impressive. And think about the beauty of the scenery you're passing. And think about the fact that you're getting places much faster than your ancestors ever dreamed. Enjoy the ride. Enjoy the life. Now, if there are moments when you're feeling reckless and you're feeling irresponsible, you can always refer back to the graphic horror of what might happen should there be an accident, God forbid. So that information, that negative picture, is a useful one. It's a true reality. Yes, accidents are horrible. Uh, and you can always use it to motivate yourself to put on the seatbelt. But if you're doing this every day, every time you fasten the seatbelt, you imagine yourself disfigured. That is not healthy. That is not good. That is not desirable. I'm thinking about the role of punishment, suffering, dire consequences. How prominent should that be in our thinking, in our daily thinking? If a person is constantly conscious, every time he makes a move, every time he makes a decision, every time he does something, he is vividly conscious of the fact that there's a reward for what I just did or there's a punishment for what I just uh, avoided doing. This is not healthy. This is not holy. This is not what Judaism expects of a person. So what is all the talk about punishment? What is all the talk about suffering? Well, the first thing is, when God promises reward and punishment, he's basically saying, there is justice in the world. He's not threatening punishment. He's saying, there is a balance. There's good, there's evil, there's better, there's worse, and there is judgment. What you do matters. You do good, you get good. You do bad, you get bad. It's not a threat. It's a compliment to life. Life is not an accident. Life is not, is not insignificant. 
there is judgment. Judgment means God pays attention. It matters to him. Right is right for him. Wrong is wrong for him. That's what reward and punishment is supposed to be. It's not supposed to be an intimidation. If you want to make a really cogent argument, if we were motivated, if we were constantly conscious of the dangers of driving, if you really can picture in your mind's eye the horrors, the resulting horrors of an accident that you might very well be involved in, then the logical conclusion is not buckle your seatbelt. The logical conclusion is get out of the car. Don't get into a car ever, ever. And if that's the logical conclusion of your argument, then your argument is faulty to begin with. Any argument that argues against life, it can't be a good argument. So any argument that leads you to the conclusion, maybe you're better off not living at all, because then you'll never get into an accident. See? Something's wrong with the argument. If we focus on the punishment and the suffering and, and, and the pain, the ultimate logical, logical but illogical conclusion, just quit. Don't go anywhere. Don't do anything. Don't eat because the food is poisoned. Don't breathe because the air is poisoned. And that proves that your original argument was wrong to begin with. You cannot focus on the negative because it destroys life. So again, Torah tells us there's reward and punishment to enhance your image of life, not to dampen your enthusiasm for life. The other thing is, the punishment is there to be useful. You have to know the dire consequences of misbehavior so that you'll behave. Not to live with the dire consequences, but to avoid those things that bring those consequences so that you can focus on what is enjoyable and positive about life. And that's what it means, choose life. I place before you today, God says, I place before you today a choice. The good and life, the bad and death. Choose life. Why the need? Why does God have to say choose life? If we have a choice between life and death, do we need to be encouraged to choose life? What, are we all suicidal? I think the meaning is choose life means focus on life. Not try not to die. Choose life means use life as your motivation, not death. So, of course, avoid death. Of course, don't do things that might lead to death. But once you've avoided it, it's done its job. You don't focus on death, you focus on life. And that's what it means to serve God with joy. Again, why do we need to be told? Here you have people serving God. And the question is, should I serve him with joy or should I serve him with fear and trepidation? You might justify serving God with fear and trepidation. Why? Because we're told to fear God. And God is awesome, frighteningly awesome. So you might think that that's what I should use to motivate my service of God. I serve God because if I didn't, I would be in big trouble. I obey God because to disobey him will bring down God's wrath and he will smite me. Is that true? Yes. Should I focus on that? No. Use that as a powerful, in, a powerful incentive 
when when you're kind of disheartened and discouraged and feeling a little uh, lazy and indulgent to get you off that spot, to get you off your seat. You can remind yourself of the consequences. You can focus for a moment on those consequences. That'll kick you back into gear. And now, serve God with joy. So yes, you can use the thought of punishment and suffering to avoid sin. But avoiding sin is only, is only valuable because it relieves, it releases you and frees you to go about living life properly. And that's with joy. So day by day, you focus on what is beautiful, what is godly, what is altruistic. You can serve the Creator. It's a joyful and, and enjoyable life. You know that whenever you need a little um, shot in the arm, you can remind yourself of the truth of reward and punishment, of suffering of consequences, and so on. But don't make a lifestyle out of fear. Fear is a useful tool. Joy is life. So choose life. Serve God with joy. And today, particularly, after all the pain we've already suffered as a nation, as a world, after all the consequences we've already suffered, we've paid our price. Now it's time to focus on life. Now it's time to focus on how amazing it is that we've survived all that pain, that we've come through all that pain. I just read where the previous Rebbe says when he came to America and he's talking about the Jews in Europe. And he says, here we live comfortably. We're free. Are we any better than our brothers and sisters behind the Iron Curtain? Or are they better than us? The Rebbe says, I consider every Jew in Europe a tzaddik completely righteous, even if they fail to do the mitzvahs they're supposed to do. Because just being able to take the pain and, and the difficulties without giving up on life, that's a holiness that you have to envy and respect. So in today's world, the Jewishness that we have preserved despite all odds, that's enough. We have satisfied the need for punishment. We've satisfied the need for overcoming pain. Now, only joy, only positive thinking about every Jew, about all Jews, even a little bit about yourself. So now is really the time to serve God with joy. There is no other way. Shalom Aleichem. How are you? You know, I do a lot of talking, a lot of Zooming, many classes, many subjects. But that's all formal stuff. Hopefully good stuff, but formal. We also have a Wednesday night meeting that's more informal and kind of um, Hamish. If you want to join us for that kind of an event, um, interactive, time for questions and so on, if you want to join us for this side of conversation, click on the link below and join us every Wednesday night at 9 o'clock. Well, maybe not every Wednesday night, but we try to make it every Wednesday night at 9 o'clock, a more informal chat 
which uh, can be more enjoyable at times than the formal stuff. So check it out. Click on the link and join us. Try it. You'll like it.